Okay, so welcome to your picture point on federalism. Uh, I'm using a new piece of software today, so uh, bear with me. So we'll see how this goes. Hopefully, I'll have some images for you that you'll be able to uh, follow along and fill in some data where you need to and take a few notes here and there if you want to. Maybe just a little bit different and more uh, an in-depth uh, sort of uh, lecture than what I've been doing the last few weeks. Uh, so I'm going to full screen this. And um, you can tell my voice is still kind of raspy, so bear with me. Hopefully you'll be able to... Um, hear me and um, and I won't use all the slides in this so some of them will have information for you and um, some of them you know are you know have maybe a question at the bottom you're not gonna have to turn this in so this is something for you to do and to kind of develop your uh, ideas about federalism hopefully some of those questions will be able to um, you'll be able to kind of develop them in terms of your short answer questions on the tests and so forth. So let's kind of dig right in and get an idea of uh, what federalism is. Uh, you know, in the United States, you have rights and powers, and those rights and powers are reserved to the states by the Tenth Amendment. We call that amendment the Federalism Amendment. Now, it may appear to you that since the terrorist attacks of September 11th, 2001, the federal government or sometimes the national or central government predominates almost all the time. But this actually may be a temporary exaggeration. So if you look on the screen here, uh, you can see that there are 88,576 separate governmental units in this nation, as you see on the table in front of you. That's a lot of government. And so in this section, we want to try to study that government and get an idea of how it's broken down, what powers do each level of government, state and national, have, and um, what we can kind of learn from that. I'm going to actually shrink this down again and see if I can't hide that from you. There it goes. All right, so you can kind of see the overall right there. And hopefully you um, should have a PDF that kind of goes along with this and uh, can kind of follow along with me. So you can see we've got one federal government, 50 state governments, and 88,525 local governments and how I broke them down for you here. Okay. So consider you're from France or Spain and you see the complexity of our system of government. Um, Imagine how difficult it would be for you to kind of understand such sort of system. Also, consider that a criminal action can be defined by a state law, a national law, or both. Thus, a criminal suspect can be prosecuted under a state court system or in a federal court system, or in some cases could be prosecuted in both. Often, economic regulation over exactly the same matter exists at the local level, the state level and the national level, which generates multiple forms to be completed, multiple procedures to be followed, and multiple laws to be obeyed. Now many programs are funded by the national government but administered by state and local governments. Now if we think about the relationship between um, federal, state, and local Many of these are funded by the national government, but administered by state and local governments. Now, relationships between central governments and local units are structured in various different ways. Federalism is one of those ways. Understanding federalism and how it differs from the other forms of government is important in understanding the American political system. Indeed, many political issues today Think about the one that I gave you a picture of below, lottery. How would it be different if we didn't have a federal form of government in which governmental authority is divided between the central government 
and various subunits. So down here, here you've got a lot of group of lottery winners, and how does state lotteries indicate that we have a federal system of government? Now there are nearly 200 independent nations in the world today. Each of these nations has its own system of government. Generally, though, we can describe how nations structure relationships between their central government and local units in terms of three different models, the unitary system, the confederal system, and the federal system. The most popular, both historically and today, is the unitary system. Now, a unitary system of government is the easiest one to define. Unitary systems allow ultimate governmental authority to rest in the hands of the national or central government. Consider a typical unitary system, France. There are regions, departments, and municipalities, or what they call communes in France. The regions, departments, and communes have elected and appointed officials. But so far, if we look at it, the French system seems to be very similar to the United States. But that similarity is really only at the surface. Under the unitary French system, the decisions of the local levels of government can be overruled by the national level of government. The national government can also cut off the funding of many local government activities. Moreover, in a unitary system such as in France, all questions of education, police, and use of land and welfare are handled by the national government. Great Britain, Egypt, Ghana, Israel, Japan, the Philippines, Sweden, these are all unitary systems of government today. And often you'll find a lot of unitary systems in areas that Great Britain colonized throughout the world. Now, we touched, kind of just touched upon the basics of a confederal system back in our last section when we looked at the Articles of Confederation. A confederation is the opposite of a unitary governing system. It's a league of independent states, each having their own sovereign powers. So in a confederation, a central government uh, or administration handles only those matters of concern that are expressly delegated to it. If you look at the chart below, the confederate government, the national government, can only do those things in which and here I'm going to kind of draw it out for you here. So this government can only do those things that the small states allow it to do. So, and you know, pardon my drawing, it's not very good. Um, so when we think about the central government has no ability to make any laws directly applicable to the member states. Um, unless the members give them that power in the first place. The United States under the Articles of Confederation was just such a system. Now, few, if any, confederations of this kind actually exist. Let's get rid of that box, by the way. I don't want to see my ugly drawing. All right, very good. All right. Now, there is a possible exception to this. Maybe the European Union today, a league of countries that's developing their own unifying institutions, such as a common currency called the euro, uh, might fall into this category. But I actually would say that the European Union is probably getting closer to what we're going to talk about in a minute, a federal system, because of that idea that they have a common cur uh, currency and because the national government there, in this case the union itself, can make some laws that apply to the member states. So I would think they're something close to, uh, closer to a federal system than a confederal. Um, you know, nations, you know, have formed some organizations as well. Um, examples like the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, and the United Nations. Uh, but these are organizations that states are members of, and so therefore, they're not really true confederations. So that brings us to our center. Um, and here, if you go back, here's your definition uh, for a federal system, which is a system in which states and the national government share political power and in which each has their own separate individual powers independent of the other.
Now, a federal system lies somewhere in between a unitary and a confederal form of government. Now, when we kind of talked a little bit about a federal system in our last section, that authority is going to be divided, and it's usually divided by a written constitution, but it doesn't always have to be, between a central government and these regional or subdivisional, or let's call them state governments. Uh, often the term used here is what's called a constituent government. So these here um, would be our constituent governments here. Okay. So we'll erase that again. Yikes. I don't really want to see that. Um, the central government and the constituent governments both act directly on the people through the laws and through actions of elected uh, and appointed government officials. Within each government's sphere of authority, each one is, in essence, supreme. Thus, a federal system differs very sharply from a unitary one in which the central government is the supreme power and the constituent governments derive all their authority from it. Now, Australia, Brazil, Canada, Germany, India, and Mexico are examples of other nations with federal systems. So you can kind of see the difference here. If the arrows represent power, power is coming from the central government to the constituent governments in a unitary system. It flows both ways in a federal system, and it flows from the constituent government to the national government in a confederal system. Now, why federalism, though? Why did we develop in a federal direction? Well, let's look at that question as well as some arguments for and against a federal form of government. So I'm going to flip over here. So some pros and cons. Now, as you saw in our last chapter, in our last unit, um, the historical basis for our federal system was laid down at the Constitutional Convention. Those who wanted a strong national government opposed the state rights advocates. This dichotomy continues, though, through the ratifying conventions into the several states. The resulting federal system was a compromise. The supporters of the new constitution were political pragmatists. They realized that without this sort of federalist system, the new constitution is not going to be ratified. The appeal of federalism was that it retains its state traditions and local power while establishing a strong national government capable of handling common problems. Now, even if the framers had agreed on the desirability of a unitary system, size and regional isolation would have made it very difficult to operate. At the same time of the Constitutional Convention, 13 states taken together were much larger geographically than England or France or any of the European countries. Slow travel and communication combined with geographic spread contributes to the isolation of many regions within the states. It could take weeks for all the states to be informed about a particular political decision. So a unitary system just really isn't going to work. <coughs> the arguments for federalism in the United States and elsewhere, though, involve a complex set of other factors, some of which I've talked about and some I haven't. First, for big countries such as Canada, India, and the United States, federalism allows for many functions to be, quote, farmed out uh, by the central government and, and to the states and the, pro and the uh, different provinces. So this gives them uh, an opportunity to be like little mini labs for government policy. The lower levels of government can accept responsibilities, therefore they can become the focus of political dissatisfaction rather than the national authority. Second, even with modern transportation and communication systems, the large area or population of some nations makes it very impractical to locate all political authority in just one place. So a unitary system tends to work better in a smaller country. Finally, federalism brings government closer to the people. It allows more access to and influence on government agencies and policies rather than leaving the population restive and dissatisfied with a remote, faceless, all-powerful central authority. Now, in the United States, federalism historically has yielded 
many, many benefits. State governments long have been a training ground for future national leaders. Many presidents made their political mark and you know, cut their bones as state governors. The states themselves have been testing grounds for new government programs. As United States Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis once observed, quote, it is one of the happy incidents of the federal system that a single courageous state may, if its citizens choose, serve as a laboratory and try novel social and economic experiments without risk to the rest of the country. End quote. That was Louis Brandeis in Supreme Court decision, New State Ice Company versus Liebman in 1932. Now, examples of programs pioneered at the state level include unemployment compensation, which began in the state of Wisconsin, and air pollution control, which was initiated in California. Today, all states are experimenting with policies ranging from education reforms to health insurance for its residents to homeland security defense strategies. Since the passage of the 1996 welfare reform legislation, which gave more control over welfare programs, to state governments, states have also been experimenting with different methods of delivering um, welfare assistance. One example of how the federal government has recently deferred to the states is a 2007 law allowing state governors to decide when the flag should be lowered even at a state facility. So federalism gives you a lot of good local control without sacrificing a strong national government. Now, the American way of life has always been characterized by a number of different political subcultures. And they typically divide themselves along the lines of race, ethnic origin, religion, wealth, education, and even more recently, degree of religion, religious fundamentalism, or even sexual preference. The existence of diverse political subcultures would appear to be fairly incompatible with a political authority concentrated solely in a central government. Now, had the United States developed into a unitary system, various political subcultures certainly would be less able to influence government behavior than they had been and continue to be in our system. In his classic work on American federalism, political scientist Daniel Elazar claimed that federalism's greatest virtue is that it encourages the development of distinct political subcultures. These political subcultures reflect differing needs and desires for government, which vary from region to region. Federalism, he argues, allows for, quote, a unique combination of governmental strength, political flexibility, and individual liberty. This is from his book on American Federalism, A View from the States. Indeed, the existence of political subculture allows a wider variety of factions to influence government. As a result, political subcultures have proved instrumental in driving reform, even at the national level. But not everyone thinks that federalism is such a good idea. Some see it as a way for powerful state and local interests to block progress and impede national plans. Some political units are more likely to be dominated by a single political group. This was essentially the argument that James Madison puts forth in Federalist Paper Number 10, which hopefully you're going to read at some point this semester. The dominant groups in cities and states have resisted implementing equal rights for minority groups. Some argue, however, that the dominant factions in other states have been more progressive than the national government in many areas, such as the environment. Critics of federalism also argue that too many Americans suffer as a result of the inequalities across the states. Individual states differ markedly in education, spending, and achievement, crime and crime prevention, and even the safety of their own buildings. Not surprisingly, these critics argue for increased federal legislation and oversight. This might involve creating a national standard for education and building codes, national expenditure minimums for crime control, and similar measures. Others see dangers in the expansion of national powers at the expense of the states. President Ronald Reagan, who served from 1981 to 1989, said, quote, The Founding Fathers saw the Federalist system as constructed something like a masonry wall. 
the states are the bricks. The national government is the mortar. Unfortunately, over the years, many people have increasingly come to believe that Washington is the whole wall, end quote. And that comes from uh, Reagan's text, uh, speech to the National Conference of State Legislatures in 1981. So if you look down, you can kind of get a picture here that I put for you uh, showing that the Golden Gate Bridge, the, the pollution standards here in California are much m different than they are in other states. And I chose pollution specifically because it's not something that's barred by state barriers. So kind of think about, um, about that when you um, kind of look at this question. No, excuse me. The term federal system can't be found in the U.S. Constitution, nor is it possible to find a systematic division of governmental authority between national and state governments in the Constitution. Rather, the Constitution sets out different types of powers. These powers can be classified as the powers of the national government, the powers of the states, and what we call denied powers. The Constitution also makes it clear that if a state or a local law conflicts with a national law, then the national law will prevail. Let's look first at the top part of this graphic organizer that I've given to you um, on powers of the national government, or what we would call delegated powers. The powers delegated to the national government include both expressed and implied powers, as well as the special category of inherent powers. Most of the powers expressly delegated to the national government are found in the first 17 clauses of Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. These enumerated or expressed powers include coining money, setting standards for weights and measures, making uniform naturalization laws, admitting new states, establishing post offices, and declaring war. Another important enumerated power is the power to regulate commerce among the states, a topic that I'll talk about a little bit later in this unit. Let's look in the middle box now and talk about implied powers. The implied powers of the national government are also based on Article 1, Section 8, which states that Congress shall have the power, quote, to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the government of the United States or in any department or officer thereof. And that's Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8, which is also known as the Necessary and Proper Clause. But sometimes this clause is called the Elastic Clause because it provides flexibility to the United States constitutional system. It gives Congress the power to do whatever is necessary to execute its specifically designated powers. The clause is first used in the Supreme Court decision of McCulloch versus Maryland, which I also will talk about a little bit later in this unit, to develop this concept of implied powers. Through this concept, the national government has succeeded in strengthening the scope of its authority to meet the numerous problems that the framers of the Constitution did not and could not anticipate, such as the power to make interstate highways, or social security. Now a special category of national powers that's not implied by the Necessary and Proper Clause consists of what has been labeled the inherent powers of the national government. These powers derive from the fact that the United States is a sovereign power among nations, and so its national government must be the only government that deals with other nations. Under international law, it is assumed that all nation states, regardless of their size or their power, have an inherent right to ensure their own survival. To do this, each nation must have the ability to act in its own interest among and within the community of nations. For instance, they sh all people agree that they should be able to make treaties, wage war, seek trade, and acquire territory. Note that no specific clause in the Constitution says anything about the acquisition of additional land. Nonetheless, though the federal government's inherent powers, we made the Louisiana Purchase in 1803 and then went on to acquire Florida, Texas, Oregon, Alaska, Hawaii, and other lands. The United States 
grew from a mere 13 states to 50 states plus several territories. The national government has these inherent powers whether or not they have been enumerated in the Constitution. Some constitutional scholars categorize inherent powers as a third type of power, me also being one of them as I've given you a separate box. These powers are completely distinct from the delegated powers both expressed and implied of the national government. Now let's go down to the bottom part and look at the shared powers or what are often in many cases, especially this middle box, powers of the state governments. And pardon me for just a second, I need to get a drink here and wet my voice a little bit. All right. Now the important part here is, uh, especially when we're talking about reserve powers, and that's what we're going to look at first, is the Tenth Amendment. Now, the Tenth Amendment states that the power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states or to the people. These are the reserve powers that the national government cannot deny to the states. Because these powers are not expressly listed, and because they are not limited to powers that are expressly limited, there is sometimes a question to whether or not a certain power is delegated to the national government, or is it reserved to the states? State powers have been held to include each state's right to regulate commerce with its own borders and to provide for a state militia. States also have the reserve powers to make laws on all matters not prohibited to the states by the U.S. Constitution or state constitutions and not expressly nor by implication delegated to the national government. Furthermore, the states have what's called police power, the authority to legislate for the protection of the health, morals, safety, and welfare of their own people. Their police power enables states to pass laws governing such activities as crimes, marriage, contracts, education, interstate transportation, and land use. The ambiguity, though, of the Tenth Amendment has allowed the reserve powers of the states to be defined differently at different times in our history. When there is widespread support for increased regulation by the national government, no one's ever heard of the Tenth Amendment. When the tide turns the other way in favor of states' rights, the Tenth Amendment is resurrected to justify uh, arguments supporting increased states' rights. So the Tenth Amendment is uh, an amendment of convenience. Now looking over at this right box, we'll talk about concurrent powers. Now in certain areas, states will share what are called concurrent powers with the national government. Most concurrent powers are not specifically listed in the Constitution, they are only implied. Now an example of a concurrent power is the power to tax. The types of taxation are divided between the levels of government. For example, states may not levy a tariff, and a tariff is a tax on an imported good. Only the national government can do this. Neither government may tax the facilities of the other. If the state governments did have the power to tax, they would have be able to uh, function on their own, other than on a um, ceremonial basis. Other concurrent powers include the power to borrow funds, establish courts, and to charter banks and corporations. To a limited extent, then, the national government exercises police power itself, and to the extent that it does, police power itself is a concurrent power. Concurrent powers exercised by the states are normally limited to the geographic area of each state and to those functions not granted by the Constitution exclusively to the national government, such as the coinage of money and the negotiation of treaties, which are specifically stated given to the national government. Let's look at this third box here, and these would be denied or prohibited powers. Now the Constitution prohibits or denies a number of powers to the national government. For example, the national government expressly has been denied the power to impose taxes on goods sold to other countries called an export. Moreover, any power not granted expressly or explicitly to the federal government by the Constitution is prohibited to it. For example, Many legal experts believe that the national government could not create a national divorce law 
without a constitutional amendment. States are also divided among certain powers. For example, no state is allowed to enter into a treaty on its own with another country. A couple of other denied powers that you should be familiar with here would be one being an ex post facto law. That's a law in which something is legal today and we make it illegal tomorrow and then go back and charge you with a crime. No national or state government can pass an ex post facto law. The second type of denied power in the Constitution would be a bill of attainder. A bill of attainder would be a legislative punishment saying if you could do this certain act you would go directly to jail. So it would be like skipping over that um, or the hitting the space on Monopoly board that says go directly to jail without a trial, without the opportunity to show your innocence. So it's a fundamental protection within the Constitution. Now tying all this together is the supremacy of the national government over the states through what is called the Supremacy Clause of the Constitution. The Supremacy Clause, or what's known as Article 6, Clause 2, states the following, quote, This Constitution and the laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land, and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby, anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary notwithstanding. In other words, states cannot use their reserved or concurrent powers to thwart national policies. All national and state officers, including judges, must be bound by oath to support the Constitution. Hence, any legitimate exercise of national government power supersedes any conflicting state action. Of course, Deciding whether a conflict actually exists, though, is a matter for the courts. And you'll see that when we get to the case of McCulloch versus Maryland. Now, national government legislation in a concurrent area is said to preempt or take precedence over conflicting state or local laws or regulations in that area. One of the ways in which the national government has extended its powers, particularly during the 20th century, is through the preemption of state and local laws by national legislation. In the first decade of the 20th century, fewer than 20 national laws preempted laws and regulations issued by state governments. By the beginning of the 21st century, the number had grown into the hundreds. Some political scientists believe that national supremacy is critical for the longevity and smooth functioning of the federal system. Nevertheless, the application of this principle has been a continuous source of conflict. Indeed, you're going to see here, the most extreme example of this conflict is going to be the Civil War. And we can boil the Civil War into a conflict over the Supremacy Clause. Now think back to our last unit, and remember that one of the concerns of the framers was to prevent the national government be from becoming too powerful. For that reason, they divided the government into three branches, legislative, executive, and judicial. But they also created a system of checks and balances that allowed each branch to check the actions of the other. The federal form of government created by these framers also involves checks and balances. So we could call these checks vertical checks and balances because they involve relationships between the states and the national governments. They can be contrasted with the idea of horizontal checks and balances in which the branches of government that are on the same level, either state or national, can check each other. All right, so take a break here. Look over this vocabulary that I have for you and make sure that you have a fairly good grasp on all of these terms. If you don't, then flashcard them do what you got to do on Quizlet or another app like that and make sure that you know the definitions for these terms. Okay. Let's look at some relationships between states and the national government. 
So, so far, we've really only examined the relationship between the central government and state governments. But the states themselves have constant commercial, social, and other dealings uh, at a constant level. The national constitution imposes certain, let's call them rules of the road, uh, on this concept of interstate relations. These rules have had the effect of preventing any one state from setting itself apart and making it more important than the other states. The three most important clauses governing interstate relations in the Constitution, by the way, all of which were in the Articles of Confederation, require each state to do the following. The first is the full faith and credit clause. Let's see if I can make that appear for you. Here it is. So every state must give full faith and credit to every other state's public acts, records, and judicial proceedings. So these would be public documents. And this would be Article 4, Section 1. The second would be the Privileges and Immunities Clause, which extends to every other state citizen the privileges and immunities of its own citizens and that's article 4 section 2 so here no state may treat any citizen fundamentally different for example they couldn't pass a law that says they can't use Virginia's courts or Virginia's roads we have to treat our citizens from our state and other states fairly well equally the third, and I'm going to move down here, so if you needed this information, just hit pause, would be to agree to return people who are fleeing from justice in another state back to their home state when requested to do so. And that's called extradition. And that's Article 4, Section 2 as well. Right? Now, we follow these constitutional mandates but the rules aren't always set in stone, and so it's not always an easy process for the states. For example, one question that's arisen in recent years is whether states will be constitutionally obligated to recognize same-sex marriages performed in other states. And if we look here at the full faith and credit clause, we would seem to be that with marriage certificates, the answer would be yes. But federal courts are conflicted of whether or not a state that doesn't allow same-sex marriage then has to honor something that they explicitly don't allow. It's a question for federal courts and it's currently being litigated. Recently here in the state of Virginia, a federal court judge in the Virginia Beach area specifically did say that the state of Virginia's Supreme, um, state constitutional amendment banning same-sex marriage did violate the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. So we'll just have to follow that and see how that goes. Let's look at our last box. Now additionally, states can enter into uh, agreements with other states, and these are called interstate compacts. Now they have to be consented to by Congress, but in reality, congressional consent is necessary only if such a compact increases the power of the contracting states relative to other states or to the national government. Now a typical example of an interstate compact is the establishment of the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey by a compact between those two states in 1921 and the regulation of the production of crude oil and natural gas by the Interstate Oil and Gas Compact of 1935. Here I've given you another one in which all 50 states are members of the driver's license compact which allows law enforcement and DMVs from one state to access driver's license information from other states preventing citizens from just going over state lines and getting a new driver's license. <coughs> Excuse me. Alright, so that kind of gives us some background, some basis in interstate relations. How did this constitutional system, though, um, develop? And I'll let you kind of go back to this page and look at that. Which brings us here to McCulloch versus Maryland. Now, 
Recall from our last unit that constitutional language, in order to be effective and to endure, must have some degree of flexibility in it. Uh, the powers delegated to the national government and the powers reserved to the states contain these elements of flexibility, thus leaving the door open for different interpretations of federalism. Disputes over the boundaries of national versus state powers have characterized this nation from its very beginning. In the early 1800s, the most significant disputes arose over differing interpretations of the implied powers of the national government under the Necessary and Proper Clause and over the respective powers of the national government and the states to regulate commerce. Although political bodies at all levels of government play important roles in this process, ultimately, and this is important, it's the Supreme Court that casts the final vote. Now, as you might expect, the character of the court will have a great impact on the ultimate outcome of any dispute. So from 1801 to 1835, the Supreme Court was headed by Chief Justice John Marshall, a Federalist who advocated a strong centralized government. So therefore we call this period really one of nationalization. Let's look at two cases. One, McCulloch versus Maryland, and the second, Gibbons versus Ogden. Both cases are considered milestones or landmark Supreme Court decisions in the movement toward national government supremacy. So I've given you some questions here. So try to answer these, and uh, you can flip through your copy here while I'm kind of going over this and on your own. It's important for you, though, to have some very basic facts and understand the decision-making process of both of these decisions. Now, the United States Constitution says nothing in it about chartering a national bank. And I, again, must wet my throat here. Nevertheless, at different times, Congress has chartered two banks, the first national bank and the second national bank of the United States, and provided at least part of the capital to get these banks started. So they are, truly are national banks. The government of Maryland, though, imposed a tax on the second bank, Baltimore branch, in an attempt to put that branch out of business. It was competing with local state banks, and they wanted to put it out of business. The branch's cashier, James Willem, William McCulloch, uh, that was a mouthful, uh, refused to pay the, ma the Maryland tax. So therefore, Maryland takes the National Bank to court. And of course, they're going to take it to their state court. And since Maryland was suing the national government in its state court, of course, they won. But the national government will then appeal the case to the Supreme Court, because one of the court's powers is to resolve disputes between the national government and states. One of the issues before the court was whether the national government had the implied power under the Necessary and Proper Clause to charter a bank and contribute capital to it. The other important question before the court was the following. If the bank was constitutional, could a state tax it? In other words, was a state action that conflicted with a national government action invalid under the Supremacy Clause? All right, so if you need to take a few minutes to get your facts and, and get your questions there, press pause. Chief Justice Marshall held that it, establishing a national bank aids the national government in the exercise of its expressed powers, then the authority to set up such a bank can be implied. Having established this doctrine of implied powers, though, Marshall then answers the other important question that's really before the court and established the doctrine of national supremacy. Marshall rules that no state could use its taxing power to tax an arm of the national government. If it could, he says, quote, the declaration that the Constitution shall be the supreme law of the land is an empty and unmeaning statement. 
Marshall's decision enabled the national government to grow and to meet problems that the Constitution's framers just were unable to foresee. And today, practically every expressed power of the national government has been expanded in one way or the other by the use of the necessary and proper or elastic clause. Now let's look at your next case, Gibbons versus Ogden. I've given you a very similar format here. So you can look over Gibbons. Now, one of the most important parts of the Constitution, included in Article 1, Section 8, is what's called the Commerce Clause, in which Congress is given the power to, quote, regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes, end quote. The meaning of this clause was really what was at the core of Gibbons versus Ogden. Now, Robert Fulton and Robert Livingston secured a monopoly on steam navigation on the waters in New York State from the New York legislature in 1803. They licensed Aaron Ogden to operate steam-powered ferry boats between New York and New Jersey. Thomas Gibbons, who had obtained a license from the United States government to operate boats in interstate waters, decided to compete with Ogden but he did so without the state of New York's permission. Ogden sued Gibbons, claiming that Gibbons was intruding upon his monopoly. The New York State Supreme Court prohibited Gibbons from operating in New York waters. Therefore, Gibbons appeals his case to the Supreme Court. Now, there are actually several issues before the court in this case. The first issue was how the term commerce should be defined. New York's highest court had defined the term narrowly to mean only the shipment of goods or the interchange of commodities, not navigation or the transport of people. The second issue was whether the national government's power to regulate interstate commerce extended to commerce within a state, what's called intrastate commerce, or was it limited strictly to commerce among the states, intrastate commerce. The third issue in this case was whether the power to regulate interstate commerce was a concurrent power, as the New York court said, or was it an exclusive national power. Now Marshall, so again, by the way, if you need the facts, okay, and you need to work on your questions here, press pause. So Marshall defines commerce as an all commercial intercourse all business dealings, including navigation and the transport of people. Marshall also holds that the commerce power of the national government can be exercised in state jurisdictions even though it cannot reach solely into intrastate commerce. Finally, Marshall emphasizes that the power to regulate interstate commerce was an exclusive national power. Marshall holds that because Gibbons was duly authorized by the national government to navigate in interstate waters, he could not be prohibited from doing so by a state court. Now, Marshall's expansive interpretation of the Commerce Clause in Gibbons versus Ogden allowed the national government to exercise increasing authority over all areas of economic affairs throughout the entire country. Gib uh, I'm sorry, Congress did not immediately exploit this broad grant of power, though. In the 1930s and subsequent decades, however, the Commerce Clause becomes the primary constitutional basis for the national government's regulation of the economy. And if you look down here at the bottom, there's John Marshall. And you can see this is a very famous statue outside the Philadelphia Museum of Art. That I included for you. Okay, so let's think about how does federalism now change over the many different years. So the controversy over slavery that leads to the Civil War took the form of a dispute over national government supremacy versus the rights of the separate states. Essentially, the Civil War brought to an ultimate and violent climax the ideological debate that had been outlined by the Federalist and Anti-Federalist parties 
even before the Constitution was ratified. Now, as we've seen, while John Marshall was Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, he did much to increase the power of the national government and to reduce that of the states. So we call this initial era, really this very first part of dual federalism, we really want to call this a, really a period of nationalization because that's John Marshall's uh, era. He's a proponent of nationalizing a lot of these powers of the Constitution. But during the Jacksonian era, from, say, about 1829 to 1837, a shift uh, back to states' rights really begins. The question of the regulation of commerce just begins one of the major issues in the federal-state relations. When Congress passed a tariff in 1828, the state of South Carolina unsuccessfully attempted to nullify the tariff which means to render it void or, or, um, or non-compliant, claiming that in cases of conflict between the state and the national government, the state should have the ultimate authority over its citizens. Now, from that point on, over the next three decades, the North and South became even more sharply divided over tariffs that mostly benefited Northern industries and over the slavery issue and so therefore, on December 20th, 1860, South Carolina formally repeals its ratification of the Constitution and withdraws from the Union. On February 4th, 1861, representatives from six southern states meet at Montgomery, Alabama to form a new government called the Confederate States of America. Now, the ultimate defeat of the South in 1865 and for all of you Civil War buffs out there this is not a class about United States history so no we're not talking about any battles or any of that other stuff but with its ultimate defeat it permanently ends the idea that a state can successfully claim the right to secede withdraw or nullify a federal action ironically the Civil War which is brought about in large part because the South's desire for increased states' rights results in the exact opposite, an increase in the political power of the national government. Oops. Thousands of new employees are hired to run the Union war effort, and they deal with the social and economic problems that had to be handled in the aftermath of war. A billion dollar war. 1.3 billion, which today is more than 17 billion, uh, national government budget was passed for the first time in 1865 to cover the increased government expenditures. The first income tax, although it was temporary, was imposed on citizens to help pay for the war. This tax and the increased national government spending were precursors to the expanded future role of the national government in the American federal system. Civil liberties were curtailed um, in the Union and in the Confederacy in the name of the wartime emergency, even in areas that were not under insurrection. The distribution of pensions and widows' benefits also boosted the national government's social role. Many scholars contend that the North's victory set the nation on a path to a modern industrial economy and society. The expansion of the national government's authority during the Civil War was reflected in the passage of the Civil War Amendments to the Constitution. Now, before the war, it was a bedrock constitutional principle that the national government should not interfere with slavery in the states. It abolished the institution altogether. That way, It abolishes the institution through the 13th Amendment, which was ratified in 1865. Therefore, it does much more than interfere with it. The amendment also, in effect, abolished the rule by which three-fifths of slaves were counted when apportioning seats in the House of Representatives. African Americans are now counted in full. The 14th Amendment, ratified in 1868, defined who it was going to be a citizen of each state. It sought to guarantee equal rights under state law, stating that, quote, no state shall deprive any person of life, 
liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. In time, though, the courts interpreted these words to mean that the National Bill of Rights applied to state governments, but that's a development that doesn't occur for at least another 50 to 60 years. The 14th Amendment also confirmed the abolition of the three-fifths rule. Finally, the 15th Amendment in 1870 gives African Americans the right to vote in all elections, including state elections, although a century is going to pass before that right's going to be enforced in all the states. So although the outcome of the Civil War firmly establishes the supremacy of the national government and puts to rest the idea that a state could secede from the Union, the war by no means ends the debate over the division of powers in our federal system. This debate can be viewed as progressing through at least two general stages since the Civil War, and actually at least three, uh, if you think about much more modern versions of uh, federalism but definitely dual federalism and cooperative federalism. Now, so if you look here, there's cooperative federalism, and then we'll also talk about these more modern ones, creative and new federalism. Now, during the decades following the Civil War, the prevailing model of what political scientists have called dual federalism, a doctrine that emphasizes a distinction between federal and state spheres of government authority, the doctrine looks on nation and states as co-equal sovereign powers. Neither the state government nor the national government should interfere in the other's sphere of influence. Various images have been used to describe these different configurations. My favorite is a layer cake, because the state governments and the national governments are viewed as separate entities, like layers in a cake. Now, the national government is the top layer of the cake, and the state government is the bottom layer of the cake. The two layers are physically separate. They don't mix. For the most part, advocates of dual federalism believed that the state and national government should not exercise authority in the same areas. Now, the doctrine of dual federalism represented a revival of states' rights following the expansion of national authority during the Civil War. Dual federalism, after all, was a pretty accurate model of the pre-war consensus on state and national relations. So this is one of the reasons that the period before the Civil War is also sometimes referred to as dual federalism. The national income tax used to fund the war effort and the reconstruction of the South was ended in 1872. The most significant step to reverse the wartime expansions of national power, though, takes place in 1877 when President Rutherford B. Hayes withdrew the last of federal troops from the South. This meant that the national government was no longer in a position to regulate southern states that affected African Americans. Although the black population was no longer enslaved physically, it was subject to the authority of southern whites who then began to enslave African Americans both socially and economically. Now, the Civil War crisis drastically reduced the influence of the United States Supreme Court. In the pre-war Dred Scott decision, or Dred Scott versus Sanford in 1856, the court had attempted to abolish the power of the national government to restrict slavery in the territories. But in doing so, the court placed itself on the losing side of the impending conflict. After the war, Congress took the unprecedented step of exempting the entire process of Southern Reconstruction from judicial review. The court had little choice but to acquiesce to Congress's uh, wishes. Now in time, the Supreme Court uh, will uh, reestablish itself as the legitimate constitutional umpire. Its decisions, though, still tend to support dual federalism and defended states' rights and limit the power of the national government. So in this picture, 
here you can see President Lincoln meeting with some of his generals and how does the war uh, impact the size of the national government. So that's a very famous photo for you to look at. And here are Freedmen's Villages um, that were created post Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, which is one of the very first executive orders of a president. And um, you can see which one of the Civil War amendments does this really, uh, really apply to. So in 1895, the court ruled that a national income tax was unconstitutional. In subsequent years, the court backed away from this decision and eventually might have overturned it. But in 1913, the 16th Amendment explicitly authorized a national income tax. In this sense, Congress and the states checked the power of the court and amended the Constitution. For the court, dual federalism meant that the national government could intervene in state activities through grants and subsidies, but for the most part it was barred from regulating matters that the court considered to be purely local. The court generally limited the exercise of police power to the states. For example, in 1918, the court ruled that a 1916 national law banning child labor was unconstitutional because it attempted to regulate a local police problem. In effect, the court placed severe limits on the ability of Congress to legislate under the Commerce Clause of the Constitution. So here I have a picture for you of children who were working locally here in Danville, Virginia, rolling cigarettes. Some of them as young as seven. Now the doctrine of dual federalism receded into the background in the 1930s as the nation attempted to deal with the Great Depression. Franklin D. Roosevelt was inaugurated on March 4, 1933, as the 32nd President of the United States. In the previous year, nearly 1,500 banks had failed, and more than 4,000 more would fail in 1933. 32,000 businesses had closed down, and almost one-fourth of the labor force was unemployed. The public expected the national government to do something about the disastrous state of the economy, but for the first three years of the Great Depression, from 1930 to 1932, the national government had done very little. President Herbert Hoover, who served from 1929 to 1933, clung to the doctrine of dual federalism and insisted that unemployment and poverty were local state issues. The states, not the national government, had the sole responsibility for combating the effects of the unemployed and providing relief to the poor. Roosevelt, however, did not feel bound by this doctrine, and his new Democratic administration energetically intervened in the economy. Roosevelt's New Deal included large-scale emergency anti-poverty programs. In addition, the New Deal introduced major new laws regulating economic activity such as the National Industrial Recovery Act of 1933, which established the National Recovery Administration, or the NRA, not the National Rifle Association. The NRA, initially the centerpiece of the New Deal, provided codes for every industry to restrict competition and regulate labor relations. Now, Roosevelt's expansion of national authority was challenged by the Supreme Court which continued to adhere to their doctrine of dual federalism. Remember, the court's not elected, so it's <clears throat> somewhat insulated from the political process. In 1935, the court ruled that the NRA pro program was unconstitutional. The NRA had turned out to be largely unworkable and unpopular anyway. The court, however, rejected the program on the grounds that it regulated intrastate and not interstate commerce. This position appeared to rule out any alternative recovery plans that might be better designed than the NRA. Subsequently, the court struck down the Agricultural Adjustment Act, or the AAA, the Bituminous Coal Act, a railroad retirement plan, 
legislation to protect for farm mortgages and a municipal bankruptcy act. <clears throat> so by 1937, Roosevelt had had enough. He proposed legislation that would allow him to add up to six new justices to the Supreme Court. Presumably, these new justices would be more friendly to the exercise of national power than the existing members were. Roosevelt's move was widely seen, though, as an assault on the Constitution. Congressional Democrats refused to support him, and it failed. Nevertheless, this, quote, court-packing scheme had its intended effect. Although the membership of the court didn't change, after 1937, the court gave up its attempts to limit the national government's powers under the Commerce Clause. And for the next 50 years, the Commerce Clause would provide Congress with an essentially unlimited justification for regulating the economic life of the country. So here in this photo, you see women working at a WPA program. Now, some political scientists have described the era uh, since 1937 as cooperative federalism, which I think is a very good description, in which states and national government are, are going to give up their layer cake um, differences, and they're going to work together to solve complex common problems. Roosevelt's New Deal programs, for example, often involve joint action between the national government and the states. The pattern of a national state relationship during these years gave rise to a new metaphor for federalism, that of a marble cake. Unlike a layer cake, in a marble cake, the two types of cake are intermingled, and any bite contains a cake of both flavors. Yummo. As an example of how national and state governments work together under the cooperative federalism model, consider the Aid to Families with Dependent Children, or the AFDC, a welfare program that was established during the New Deal. In 1996, though, the AFDC was replaced by the TANF, the Temporary Assistance to Needy Families. Government loves its acronyms. Under the AFDC program, the national government provided most of the funding, but state governments established benefit levels and eligibility requirements for recipients. Local welfare offices were staffed by state, not national employees, and in return for national funding, the states then had to conform to a series of regulations on how the program was to be carried out. These regulations tended to become more elaborate over time more and more and more rules. The 1960s and 70s were a time of even greater expansion of national government's role in domestic policy. The evolving pattern of state and local government relationships gave rise to yet another metaphor, one called picket fence federalism or uh, creative federalism, a concept devised by political scientist Terry Sanford. The horizontal boards in the fence represent the different levels of government, national, state, and local, while the vertical pickets represent the various programs and policies in which each level of government is involved. Officials at each level of government work together to promote and develop the policy represented by each picket on the fence, hence picket fence federalism. Now, even before the Constitution was adopted, the national government gave grants, and that's how these different forms of federalism. So as I'm changing the page here, I just noticed that there was a vocabulary check. So let's make sure, before I go on to my notes, let's make sure that you've looked over this vocabulary. Uh, by the way, creative federalism, picket fence federalism, they're pretty much the same. Uh, just a different way to, to look at it. But make sure that you know all of this vocabulary here and you're familiar with it before you go on. If you need to make flashcards or do whatever you got to do. Flashcards is a great way to study, by the way. I know I've told you that a million times, but I'll tell you to a million times more. All right, so now let's go on to looking at uh, grants and government spending. The national government is going to provide, um, can provide grants not just in money, but in land, um, in uh, assistance, 
all kinds of different things. Uh, in the 20th century, federal grants increased significantly, especially during the Roosevelt administration during the Great Depression. And then again in the 1960s, when the dollar amount of grants is going to quadruple. These funds were used for improvements in education, pollution control, recreation, highways. With an increase of grants, though, came a bewildering number of regulations and restrictions that just perplex the average person. And so I'm going to actually come back to these. So uh, what I want you to do is you can kind of look here um, and go to this page. And I just noticed that my blocks kind of overlapped there when I built that. Oops. So sorry about that. Um, but as I kind of go through these, you can define them here in each one. And, um, and then I'll come back and look at those two charts. So the first is a categorical grant. And by 1985, categorical grants will amount to more than $100 billion a year. They were spread out across 400 separate programs, but the five largest will account for over 50% of the money spent. These five programs involve Medicaid, or health care for the poor, highway construction, unemployment benefits, housing assistance, and welfare programs to assist mothers with dependent children and people with disabilities. For fiscal year 2008, the national government gave an estimated $230 billion to the states through federal grants. The shift toward a greater role for the central government, though, can be seen in this figure. So if you go back and look at this figure, you can see shifting national government. So I gave you a pie chart of 1927 to 1940 here. Before the 1960s, most categorical grants by the national government were formula grants. These grants took their name from the method that was used to allocate the funds. They fund state programs using a formula based on variables such as the need of the state, population, or willingness to come up with matching funds. But beginning in the 1960s, the national government began to increasingly offer program grants. This funding required states to apply for grants for specific programs. The applications are evaluated by the national government, and the applications may compete. So some people have called this, and especially this era that we're in, um, competitive federalism, because the states are competing with, a, um, with each other for a greater amount of federal dollars. Program grants give the national government a greater degree of control over state activities than do uh, formula grants. Now, federal grants to the states have increased significantly. So if we look at this here, and you look at this bar chart, you can see that the number of grants um, has dramatically increased. One reason for this is that Congress has decided to offload some programs to the states and just provide the major part of the funding. Also, Congress continues, continues to use grants to persuade states and cities to operate programs devised by the federal government. And finally, states are often are happy to apply for grants because they're relatively free, requiring only that the state match a very small portion of the grant. So when they say matching funds, for example, the state may only have to match maybe 1% or 5% of the total funds. States can still face criticism for accepting these grants because their matching funds might be diverted from some other state program, but often the governmental leaders at the state level look at this as easy money. So no dollars sent to the states, though, are completely free of strings. You know, there are always some kinds of strings attached. However, all funds come with requirements that must be met by the states. Often, through the use of grants, the national government has been able to exercise substantial control over matters that traditionally have been under the purview of state governments. When the federal government gives federal funds for highway improvements, for example, it may condition those funds on the state's cooperation with a federal policy. This is exactly what the federal government did in the 1980s and 90s to force the states to raise their minimum drinking age to 21. 
Such a carrot and stick tactic has been used as a form of coercion in recent years as well. Um, so if we fast forward up here and look at this political cartoon, um, President George Bush signs the No Child Left Behind Act into law. Under No Child Left Behind, Bush promised billions of dollars to the states to bolster their education budgets. The funds, though, would only be delivered if states agreed to hold schools accountable on standardized tests. Education traditionally had been under state control, though, and the conditions for receiving No Child Left Behind funds effectively stripped the states of some of their autonomy in creating standards for their public schools. And this is one of the reasons that many states, I think it's, I think the number is like 46 out of 50, are using what's now called the Common Core Standard. So you can kind of look at that cartoon and see what you think about that. So we'll go back to this, and now let's look at block grants. Block grants lessen the restrictions on federal grants given to a state and local governments by grouping a number of categorical grants under one broad heading. Governors and mayors generally prefer a block grant because such grants give the states more flexibility in how the funds are spent. Members of Congress, on the other hand, like categorical grants because therefore they can direct the money where they want it to be spent and that especially will help them at election time. One major set of block grants provides aid to state welfare programs. The Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act, that's a mouthful, isn't it, uh, ended this program. The TANF program that replaced the AFDC, or Aid to Families with Dependent Children, provided a welfare block grant to each state and each grant has an annual cap, a maximum amount. According to some, this is one of the most successful block grant programs. Although state governments prefer block grants, Congress, again, generally favors categorical grants because the expenditures can be targeted according to congressional priorities, and, again, at election time, they can point to actual physical things and say look what I have done for you and this is why you should reelect me. One more area we need to discuss here and that's that of federal mandates. For years the federal government has passed legislation requiring states improve environmental conditions and civil rights. Since the 1970s the national government has enacted literally hundreds of these federal mandates requiring the states to take some action in areas ranging from the way voters are registered to ocean dumping restrictions to clean air. The Unfunded Mandates Reform Act of 1995 required the Congressional Budget Office to identify mandates that cost state and local governments more than fifty million dollars to implement. Nevertheless, the federal government routinely continues to pass mandates for state and local governments that cost more than that to implement. Let me give you an example. I'll give you a couple of examples, actually. The National Conference of State Legislatures has identified federal mandates in states, uh, to the states in transportation, health care, education, environment, homeland security, election laws, and other areas with a total cost of $29 billion per year. Water quality mandates appear to be particularly expensive. Um, another one, and often these federal mandates sound great, so let me give you another one. Um, when we think about the Americans with Disabilities Act, or the, um, the ADA, which was passed in 1994 to give um, access to public buildings to people with um, recognized disabilities. This sounds like a great act. Why would we not want to have such an act? But many federal buildings and state buildings and local buildings were older and had to be retrofitted for, um, to build these access ramps and elevators and so forth. And that retrofitting and that building in new buildings cost state and local governments billions of dollars to meet the mandate. 
Um, here in our own school, the elevator that we have from the first floor to the second floor is actually part of that mandate of the Americans with Disabilities Act. So often, while something sounds good, it does have a dark side to it, which if you count up all the elevators in all the schools combined, that's a lot of money. Plus, you got to maintain them. That's what we mean by an unfunded federal mandate, because the federal government doesn't provide any funds for states to, um, to meet that requirement. So let's talk just a little bit here toward the end about the politics of federalism. So here I've got some pictures in terms of voting and, and other things that we just kind of want to think about uh, while we finish up. Now we talked about the allocation of powers between national and state governments and that continues to be a pretty big issue. Let's look at some of the areas of conflict between national government and state governments today. Why is it that conservatives have favored the states and liberals favor the national government? Well, one answer is that throughout American history, the expansion of national authority typically has been an engine of social change. Far more than the states, it's been the national government that's been willing to alter the status quo. Again, I've got to work on my throat a little bit here. The expansion of national government authority during the Civil War freed the slaves. That's a major social revolution. During the New Deal, the expansion of national authority meant unprecedented levels of government intervention in the economy. In both of these examples, support for states' rights was a method of opposing this change, and therefore they supported the status quo. Another example of the use of national power to change society was the presidency of Lyndon Johnson from 1963 to 1969. Johnson oversaw the greatest expansion of national authority since the New Deal. Under Johnson, a series of civil rights acts forced the states to grant African Americans equal treatment under the law. Crucially, these acts included the abolition of all measures designed to prevent African Americans from voting. Johnson's Great Society and War on Poverty programs resulted in major increases in spending by the national government, but as before, States' rights were invoked to support the status quo. States' rights meant no action on civil rights and no increase in anti-poverty spending. When state governments have authority in a particular field, there will be great variations from state to state in how issues are handled. Inevitably, some states will be more conservative than others. Therefore, bringing national authority to bear on a particular issue might have the effect of imposing a national standard on a state that, for whatever reason, has not adopted such standard. One example is the voting rights legislation passed under President Johnson. By the 1960s, there was a national consensus that all citizens, regardless of race, should have the right to vote. A majority of the white electorate in certain states, however, did not share this view. National legislation was deemed necessary to impose the national consensus on states that didn't want to meet what the majority wanted them to do. Another factor that may make states more receptive to limited government, especially on economic issues, is competition among the states. It's widely believed that major corporations are more likely to establish new operations in a state with a more favorable business climate. National legislation regulating business activities within all the states make it more difficult for an individual state to create a more favorable business climate within its border relative to the other states. Yet another factor that might encourage states to favor limited national authority is the relative power of the local economic interests. A large corporation in a small state, for example, may have a substantial amount of political influence. Such a corporation, which has experienced success within the existing framework, may be opposed to any changes within that framework. These local economic interests may have less influence, though, at the national level. Finally, the states may simply feel they can just do a better job of regulating activities in their own state 
than the federal government can. After all, state governments are closer to and more knowledgeable about problems that affect the population within their own borders. Uniform standards imposed by the national government may not be as effective as state regulations in addressing these problems. Alternatively, the state may conclude that national regulations just don't go far enough in curbing certain problems, such as air pollution. At times, state and local governments take action on matters normally considered to be a federal responsibility. Immigration is a good example of that. In the years after 1968, the devolution of power from the national government to the states became a major ideological theme for the Republican Party. Republican President Richard Nixon from 1969 to 1974 advocated what he called new federalism. And new federalism was supposed to devolve authority from the national government to the states. In part, new federalism involved the conversion of categorical grants into block grants, thereby giving state governments greater flexibility in spending. A second part of Nixon's new federalism was called revenue sharing. And under the revenue sharing plan, the national government provided direct, unconditional financial support to state and local governments based upon their population. Nixon was able to obtain only a limited number of block grants from Congress, but the block grants he did obtain plus revenue sharing, substantially increased the financial support to state governments. Republican President Ronald Reagan from 1981 to 1989 was also a strong advocate of federalism, but some of his policies withdrew certain financial support from the state. Reagan was more successful than Nixon in obtaining block grants, but Reagan's block grants, unlike Nixon's, were less generous to the states than the categorical grants that they replaced. Under Reagan, revenue sharing was eliminated. And if you go back to this graph, so this is the year here that Reagan is in power. And so if we look here by 1990, you can see here that under Reagan, revenue sharing is eliminated. And you can see where the results are that a dramatic decrease in federal spending to the states um, happens. So let's go back forward to where we were. We're still talking about federalism and let's talk a little bit about education here in a minute. And so today federalism at least in the sense of the limited national authority doesn't always seem to be such an important element in conservative ideology, although I would say it's a good portion of it is maybe somewhat driving this Tea Party movement uh, in America, that the federal government, again, has gotten too large and um, needs to be scaled back. It's not clear whether competing theories of federalism divide Republicans from Democrats. Um, or if it actually brings us closer together. We're just not sure. Consider that the passage of the welfare reform legislation in 1996, which involved transferring significant tr control of welfare programs to states, took place under a Democratic president, Bill Clinton, with a Republican Congress. Hmm. I don't know, just things to think about. In contrast, under Republican President George W. Bush, Congress enacted the No Child Left Behind Act of 2001, which was then signed into law in 2002. This act increased federal control over education and educational funding, which had traditionally been under the purview of state governments. Indeed, the Bush administration often exercised federal control over areas that had often been state-dominated areas, such as health, safety, and the environment. And today's Obama administration has taken that step even further. Um, the Environmental Protection Agency has been extremely active, as well as uh, many other agencies, Interior and uh, State and, um, and the uh, Department of Justice. 
So again, we got a little bit of a vocab check here. We're still going to talk about United States versus Lopez. So I haven't really got to that yet, but I did want to just kind of, because we're going to talk about federalism today, and that kind of brings you to this political cartoon. I'm not going to talk about it in specific. Uh, bring your questions to class on it. Uh, but I do want to talk, just finish off here about today's Supreme Court with federalism. So when we think about today's court, which normally has the last say on these constitutional issues, today's court still plays an extremely important issue um, role in determining the line between federal and state powers. If we go back to the decisions rendered by Chief Justice John Marshall that I talked about earlier, Marshall's broad interpretation of the Commerce Clause made it possible for the national government to justify its regulation of virtually any activity when it really needed to during the 1930s. In the 1990s and 2000, the court has evidenced a willingness to impose some limits, though, on the national government's authority under the Commerce Clause and other constitutional provisions. As a result, it's difficult to predict how today's court might actually rule on a case involving federalism. The court is ideologically very split, which we haven't really gotten to that part of about um, the judicial branch and so forth. But when we look at federalism, it's hard to predict how they're going to rule on things simply because you have a very defined split of four liberal justices, four fairly conservative justices, and one justice kind of in the middle. Take, for example, President Obama's Affordable Care Act, where most people who observed the court had no clue on how the court was going to rule simply because they didn't understand necessarily how they the court was going to fall one way or the other on this issue of can the government force you to buy a product. In the end, the court will rule that it's a legitimate use of the taxing power. But since the 1990s, there has been a small, modest trend on the part of the Supreme Court to give some greater weight to states' rights than was true for most of the 20th century. In a widely publicized 1995 case, United States versus Lopez, the Supreme Court held that Congress had exceeded its constitutional authority under the Commerce Clause when it passed the Gun-Free School Zone Act in 1990. Again, sounds like a pretty good bill. We all want our schools to be gun-free. The court stated that the act, which banned the possession of guns within 1,000 feet of any school, was unconstitutional because it attempted to regulate an area that had, quote, nothing to do with commerce or any sort of economic enterprise, end quote. United States versus Lopez. This marked the first time in nearly 60 years that the Supreme Court had actually placed a limit on the national government's authority under the Commerce Clause. The court subsequently invalidated portions of another law that had to do with um, violence against women on the grounds that Congress had again exceeded its authority under the Commerce Clause while a national law preventing violence against women sounded good, the court said there was just no constitutional basis for it, that the necessary and proper clause has to have a, um, has to be attached to a specific expressed clause in the Constitution that it's implying from, and violence against women or guns in school is neither one of them or commerce, and so therefore, what's the express power? Well, the court couldn't find one. In 1999 and the early 2000s, the court also issued decisions that bolstered the authority of state governments under the 11th Amendment to the Constitution. The cases involved employees and others who sought redress for state government violations of federal laws concerning uh, employment. The court held that the 11th Amendment, in most circumstances, precludes lawsuits against state governments for violations of rights established by federal laws unless the states consent themselves to be sued. By the way, that doesn't happen very often. Additionally, 
the court supported states' rights under the Tenth Amendment when it invalidated in 1997 provisions of a federal law that required state employees to check the backgrounds of prospective handgun purchasers in Prince versus United States. Although the court has tended to favor state rights in many of its decisions, in other decisions, it has still backed the federal government's position. For example, in two cases decided in 2003 and 2004, the court, in contrast to its earlier rulings involving the 11th Amendment, ruled that the amendment could not shield states from suits by individuals complaining of discrimination based on gender and disability. Also in 2005, the court held that the federal government's power to seize and destroy illegal drugs trumped California's law legalizing the use of marijuana for medical treatment. Yet less than a year later, the court favored states' rights when it upheld Oregon's controversial death with dignity law, which allowed patients with terminal illnesses to choose to end their lives early and thus alleviate suffering. The Supreme Court also supported state claims in a 2007 case, Massachusetts versus EPA. In this case, which many have since hailed as the most significant decision on environmental law in decades, was brought against the EPA uh, by Massachusetts and several other states, as well as various cities and environmental groups. The groups claim that the EPA, which administers the Clean Air Act and other laws regulating the environment, had the authority to and should regulate carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. The EPA maintained that it lacked the authority to do so, arguing that members of Congress, when passing the Clean Air Act, had not envisioned a massive greenhouse gas program. The court, however, held that the EPA did have such regulatory authority. The court stated that the EPA could choose not to regulate auto emissions or other heat trapping gases, but only if it could provide a scientific basis for its refusal. The 5-4 to four decision was a strong rebuke to the Bush administration, which had refused to regulate carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases under the Clean Air Act. One year after this Supreme Court ruling, Massachusetts and the other states were back in federal court suing the EPA again for dragging its feet on issuing carbon dioxide recommendations. Apparently, the EPA had prepared a recommendation by the end of 2007, but the White House had blocked its release. So this issue between federalism and, or the issue of federalism between states' rights and national government, very difficult to predict. And really the makeup of the court has a tremendous amount to do with what direction um, government is going to go when these issues have to be judicially resolved. For example, here's a very good uh, political cartoon. This came out of a 2005 um, event in which a woman uh, who had been on life support for many years, uh, her husband was attempting to have her feeding tube removed and her parents were fighting against him and uh, tried to get Congress involved. It's uh, known as the Terry Schiavo case and in which Congress tried to get a federal judge to step in uh, and really trump the state of Florida's uh, rights to decide in this particular case. So while the life of the woman was at stake, there was also this question of states' rights versus federal rights. Does the federal government have the right to step in and tell doctors um, that they can't proceed with a certain medical treatment or when medical treatment is no longer available, those sorts of things. So check out that cartoon, see what images you find in there, and, um, and bring some questions to class there. The last thing that I have for you in here is a little um, economics activity on unfunded mandates, so you can kind of see what the cost is here and see if you can reason this out. So I've given you on this side rank of the top 10 states by total dollars spent from California uh, to North Carolina. And then on this side, by the percent of their state spending, so based on per capita.
So the number one state there would be Mississippi. And then see if you can answer the questions below. Um, how have unfunded federal mandates affected state and local governments? Which four states spend the most money? Why might these states spend more than other states? And then which state is affected the most? This is the big question here. See if you can reason this out and give me a reason of why um, you think your answer is right and maybe somebody else's answer is wrong. And of course, I'll probably have some points for you if you get that done. This has been um, a picture cast on uh, federalism. Bring your questions to class so I can answer them. Um, in a sense, this is going to be my attempt to kind of flip um, some of the things that we're doing in class and to bring more discussion to it. So this is going to be the lecture portions now, and hopefully you guys will have some more questions. So try to have these things done um, before you come to class. This is Mr. L, and I'm signing off. Have a great night. I'm going to rest my voice up, and I'll get your Congress one done for you as quickly as I can here. As always, be excellent. Don't get hit by a Mack truck, and if you ride your bike tonight, wear white.